I sometimes find myself wondering how it is that every year there are those few games that manage to drum up so much excitement throughout the gaming world. How is it that developers and publishers continually get us hyped with remakes, reboots, or new IPs altogether? I mean, it's obviously good marketing and, in some cases, blind trust in our favorite developers. But haven't we pretty much seen every kind of game genre combination out there? At this point, nothing should excite us, but then what kind of gamers would we be if we didn't get sucked up into the hype? And so, just like clockwork, every year there are those games that capture our attention and imaginations, for better or worse. In this video, I'll be going through my personal top 5 most anticipated games of 2020. Starting off with number 5 is Halo Infinite. Okay, so I have to admit that I haven't really been excited for a Halo game since Halo 3's release, and boy did that deliver. I wasn't too happy with Bungie's last game before becoming an independent developer in 2007, Halo Reach. I could never figure out what it was exactly that I disliked about it, but it was enough for me not to finish the campaign. The subsequent Halo games from 343 Industries didn't do it for me either. I never completed those games, which is sad to think back on now because I'm sure they were decent games. Anyway, for reasons I can't pinpoint, the announcement of Halo Infinite at 2019's E3 event had me curious and as more information was revealed about the game, the more excited I became. Still not much is known about the game except that it may possibly have an open world feel with a focus on player customization. 343 Industries seems to be aiming for a games as a service model that can keep players engaged with the game long after finishing the campaign. To me, this sounds like they want to go the Destiny route, which would be very exciting. 343 Industries will have to balance great and initial content to hook players along with a steady stream of live service updates in order to keep a respectable player base. Halo Infinite is set to release on Xbox One, Series X, and PC this holiday season. Do you ever dislike something just because it becomes too mainstream? Well congrats, you're a hipster like me. This exact thing happened to me with The Last of Us when it was released and getting universal praise from everybody and their moms. At the time, I also wasn't big on the PS3 because that's when I had the dreaded yellow light of death which plagued my chunky console. Due to that nonsense, I bought myself an Xbox 360S and lived happily in that ecosystem for a few months. Eventually I decided to give the newly redesigned PS3 another chance and picked up a shiny new PS3 Slim. I did so in part due to FOMO and all the great exclusive the consoles had at the time like Uncharted, God of War, and Killzone. All of those titles were absolutely fantastic. For some reason though I didn't play The Last of Us until after a few months of the PS4 being released and I'm kinda glad I waited because the remaster looked much better on the newer console. Let me tell you that I was hooked not even 10 minutes into the game. Becoming a father in 2013 really softened my heart to things I was completely unaffected by otherwise. So when it came to the scene in the game where Joel's daughter Sarah dies, I almost lost it. Yes sir. Listen buddy, we've just been through hell. Okay, we just need... Oh no. Sarah. Move your hands, babe. I know, baby, I know. God. Listen to me, I know this hurts. You're gonna be okay, baby. Stay with me. Right. I'm gonna pick you up. I know, baby, I know it hurts. Come on, baby, please. I know, baby, I know. Sarah. I had to pause the game and walk away for a bit to collect myself. The rest of the game has you gradually build this wonderful connection with Ellie, a young girl a little older than your daughter. Joel and Ellie go through hell together and you as a player can't help but care for them and their struggles. The game is a masterpiece in storytelling, world and character building, making it easily one of the best narrative games I've ever played. 
The Last of Us Part 2 is looking to continue the story of Joel and Ellie after their hardships from the first game. I'm looking forward to see what new characters come into their life and why it appears that Ellie is out for revenge. I have a lot of unanswered questions like what happened to Joel? Where did they end up? What has happened since the events of the first game? We'll find out on May 29th. You ever find yourself playing a game that looks super silly with a quirky art style but you can't seem to put it down? Yeah, that's the Animal Crossing franchise for me. Way back in 2002, during the GameCube days, Nintendo released the first Animal Crossing in the US. During this time, I was playing games like The Elder Scrolls 3, Morrowind, Grand Theft Auto, Vice City, and Tom Clancy's Splinter Cell. I, being a very opinionated 14 year old boy at the time, had way better things to do than to waste my time on some kitty game with talking animals and other nonsense. Then, for Christmas that year, my best friend's mom bought me Animal Crossing for my underused GameCube. I let it sit for a few days until curiosity got the best of me. I couldn't just let that mini CD sit inside that box forever. I popped it into the GameCube and started playing. For that entire day, all I did was play Animal Crossing. The game had such a satisfying gameplay loop that I easily lost track of time. For context, here is a summary of the game. You are a human who moves into a new town inhabited by talking, walking animals. You are greeted by Tom Nook, who offers his help by selling you your own little house in town. What Tom fails to tell you is that his prices are absurdly high and he pretty much locks you into a surprise mortgage. Along with the house, he also offers you a job in order to start paying off your debt. All town layouts are randomly generated so your town may look different from other players. The townsfolk are also different. You can interact with others by bringing them gifts or doing odd jobs for them. One cool aspect of the game is that it moves along in real time, so one hour in real life is one hour in the game. Along with side jobs, you can earn money by digging up fossils, selling fruits that you shake from trees, catching bugs and fish, and even participate in the game's version of the stock market which is comprised of turnips. Yes, turnips. You can make a killing by buying lots of turnips at low prices then selling when the prices skyrocket. I know this all sounds silly because even reading this out loud makes me look back to make sure my girlfriend isn't behind me judging what just came out of my mouth. But I'm not ashamed. After playing nearly all the Animal Crossing titles to date, I am still way too excited to finally get a new Animal Crossing on the Nintendo Switch. It's mindless, relaxing, and a fun time, even for grown men. Animal Crossing New Horizons comes to the Switch on March 20th. I never played the first Watch Dogs because of the controversy it went through after release. The concept of the game was innovative back then. So after seeing the complete 360 Watch Dogs 2 took with the tone of the story alone, I definitely didn't want to skip this one. To this day, I believe that Watch Dogs 2 was very underrated. The game felt like a breath of fresh air for me during a time when everything else seemed stale. The story kept me interested, as did the characters and their relationships. The recreated city of San Francisco, according to those familiar with the area, was exceptional. I've never personally been there, but I do know that it was a large, vibrant, and active open world. I loved every minute of being in this place, and the many smaller quests and miscellaneous things kept it interesting no matter where I went. Who doesn't like being a badass hacker that can take over people's cars and phones or messing with the streetlights to create havoc? Playing this game made me feel like I had awesome superpowers, but at the same time, it reminded me that I was still human. I would go as far as to say that it was a perfectly balanced game. Watch Dogs Legion will have a different setting this time around and I'm really looking forward to exploring London and seeing what cool new gadgets they have for us to use this time around. The game was originally scheduled to release in 2019, but Ubisoft pushed it into the springtime of 2020. At this point I'd be surprised if you didn't already know about Cyberpunk. Okay, so the way I'm envisioning this game is pretty much The Witcher 3, but way in the future. Probably not a good idea to go into it like that, but that's my brain for you. CD Projekt Red has set a high bar for themselves after releasing the masterpiece that was The Witcher 3, and people are expecting nothing but the best from the beloved developers with Cyberpunk 2077. Let me be honest for a second. I wasn't too thrilled with the idea of a futuristic setting, and that's mostly because I feel like everything nowadays has the aesthetic and I'm over it. I'm excited for the game because I know that CD Projekt Red cares about the quality of their products and they hit it out of the ballpark with The Witcher 3. So I'm crossing my fingers that the same level of attention and detail and great content passes along to Cyberpunk 2077. The game had its release moved to September of this year. And that concludes my top 5 most anticipated games of 2020. What about you guys? What games are you most excited for this year? Let me know by leaving a comment. Thank you all for watching. See you next time. Thank you.